Hi, I'm Larry Zitnick. I'm a researcher on the Fundamental AI Research Team at Meta. So about four years ago, I became interested in the intersection between machine learning and chemistry. And for me, it was pretty intimidating at first. I hadn't had a class in you know, over 20 years in chemistry, and even that class was an introduction to chemistry as an undergrad. So I'm hoping with this video series, we can make it less intimidating for you. So as an ML researcher, hopefully give you the background in chemistry and how machine learning algorithms are applied, so that way you can get up to speed and start working on this really important problem. But before we get into all that, let's first motivate. Why are we interested in chemistry? Why is material science, why is modeling atoms such an important problem? So when we think about today's problems, a lot of times we think about climate change or drug discovery or food scarcity. What's interesting is that we can mitigate all of these problems if we can solve one underlying task. What is this task? Well, it's a modeling of atoms. What do we mean by modeling atoms? We just picture a bunch of atoms kind of sitting in a box and all we want to do is model how do they bounce off of each other? What forces do they apply on each other? And what is the overall energy of that system? As Richard Feynman once said, everything that living things do can be understood in the terms of the jigglings and wigglings of atoms. He could have even been bolder and said that everything the world does can be understood in the terms of atoms. And to get a better sense for this, let's look at a case study. So let's take a look at this science paper. It was making a lot of bold claims. It even said, many statements you may think are of an alarmist order. Certainly they are depressing, but they are founded on stubborn facts. All civilized nations stand in deadly peril. While this might sound like it was written today, believe it or not, this paper was actually written in 1898. So what were they so worried about back then? Well, it turns out they were worried about not having enough to eat. A wheat producing soil is totally unequal to the strain put upon it. So what did they mean by this? Well, as you all know, plants need lots of water, but they also need nitrogen. And the nitrogen comes from the soil. And the way we replenish that nitrogen is by using fertilizers. Now in 1898, the most popular fertilizer was bird poo. And they got this bird poo by mining it from islands all across the oceans. And as you might not be surprised if you know much about human history, they were mining it until there was almost none left. And they were worried that they were going to run out of fertilizer and they weren't going to have enough food then to feed the world's population. It turns out that 78% of the air is actually nitrogen. The problem is, is that these nitrogen molecules are really tightly bonded together, which makes it hard for the plants to utilize. So what we need to be able to figure out how to do is to break apart those nitrogen molecules so that way we can then add hydrogen to create ammonia fertilizer. Well, the two scientists who figured this out were Haber and Bosch. They tried thousands of experiments, literally thousands of experiments, until they found the right reaction conditions which allowed them to do this chemical process. Even today, 1-2% to of the world's energy is used for this process. So what is the result of all this work? Well, in 1898, the population was a little bit under 2 billion, and today it's nearly 8 billion which means this innovation has allowed us to grow the population by nearly 5x. That's huge. I mean, think about it. It's probably the biggest you know, breakthrough that we've had as a human civilization. It's also important to note that the same advancement led to some negative consequences. The same process that's used to make ammonia fertilizer can be used to make ammunition and explosives, and this prolonged World War I. And the overuse of ammonia fertilizer is creating ocean dead zones all over the world right now. Let's look at another example, drug discovery. So a lot of times when we think about drug discovery, we think about proteins. And when we think about proteins, we think about illustrations like this one, you know, these kind of like wiggly, jiggly, you know, strings of, I don't know what these are, spaghetti uh, that we typically see. Well, what are these really? What are they representing? Well, it turns out that proteins themselves are basically a string of amino acids. And each of these amino acids is just a small collection of atoms, around 20-ish. So if we zoom in on the proteins, you can see that each of these ribbons actually is just representing different configuration of atoms. And this configuration of atoms determines how the protein folds, how it interacts with other small molecules, and how it might even move. Now let's talk about how modeling atoms can help us mitigate climate change. We all know that we want to use more solar power and more wind power, but there's an underlying problem. Here is the energy demand for an average day in California. Around noon, it's its lowest, and then when everybody goes home, turns on their TVs and their air conditioners, we see energy demand peak. 
If we look at the amount of energy generated with wind and solar during the same period, we notice, not surprisingly, that the solar power peaks around noon when the sun is brightest, and the wind generation is, you know, roughly flat. Now imagine if we increased the amount of solar and wind by three times, what would happen? Well, we get this. Now, there's two problems that immediately pop out. The first is that the amount of energy that we have around noon is way too much. We're just going to be thrown it away. And then when everybody goes home, turns on their TVs and air conditioning, we don't have enough power. So the problem is we need to figure out how to take the energy when we have it in surplus and move it to times when we have higher demand. There's a lot of ways to store renewable energy, but one of the most promising and scalable is to use surplus renewable energy to split water into oxygen and hydrogen. We can then store that hydrogen and later use it in a fuel cell to generate electricity. So hopefully this video convinced you that the modeling of atoms is a really important problem. If we could just take you know, a simple water molecule and break it apart to create hydrogen, we could have a clean energy future. So if you want to learn more, check out the next video where we discuss and describe how we model the interaction of atoms.